Hi, this is Randy Hinken. I am one of the co-founders and managing directors of Blue Frontiers, and I have with me today Dorji Sun. He's one of our advisors. Uh, Dorji, can you introduce yourself to the people watching us? Hi, everybody. Uh, uh, my name is Dorji Sun. I'm a serial social entrepreneur, done a lot of environmental work, um, including some of the pioneering rainforest carbon credit transactions. Right now, I am deeply in the decentralized world, working on a number of blockchain projects. Um, I was really attracted to Blue Frontiers because I'm a true believer in terms of the science behind climate change. And it's very clear that without dramatic action, we're gonna have rising sea levels. So something like that, which is being built by the Sea Seeing Institute and Blue Frontiers is definitely needed. Uh, added to that, I think that the fact that the Blue Frontiers team has been together and been around for, for seven years shows their commitment to the space. Uh, the fact that they've already se secured a number of, of milestones is also testament to their commitment. And lastly, you know, I, I also feel very strongly about, I guess, the inequities uh, and the in injustice uh, in terms of who's going to be affected by climate change. And as a deep, passionate believer and lover of the ocean, um, growing up in Australia, you know, we're surrounded, we're girt by sea, we're surrounded by the ocean. Um, and I grew up in Sydney by the beach. And, um, you know, you really realize that if you think about it, whether it's economically or environmentally, um, there is going to be this dramatic change. And that is uh, Pacific Islands, you know, low lying atoll like nations, they're going to be potentially consumed by the ocean, highly likely consumed by the ocean. It's already happening now. And, um, you know, there's an old adage, which is, you know, the one thing that they stopped making was land. But actually with climate change, potentially a lot of land will, will disappear. So the economic ramifications of that mean that countries which have huge amounts of ocean rights, uh, so these are economic rights for the ocean around that country, they're potentially going to be losing some of those rights unless they have some type of alternative. And that's what Blue Frontiers provides. So definitely think that for economic purposes, as well as environmental reasons, a lot of alignment. So how do you see uh, Blue Frontier's plans to offer a decentralized uh, opportunity for you know, self-governance interfacing with uh, this need to be resilient to rising seas and the opportunity for existing governments who are gonna lose their lands? Yeah, so this gets into the realm of uh, controversy. I mean, I think, there is a lot of evidence to show that democracy has had a tremendous profound impact, but is it now being limited? Is it being eroded by some of the evolutions of social media? You know, is it being eroded by, you know, questionable news and fact? Is it being eroded by lack of education with the populace as to what is true and what is false? So the question around self-governance is something which I think if you think about cryptocurrency and decentralized blockchain projects, governance is probably one of the most important and most uh, undervalued um, aspects, which is how do you, in a distributed network, make decisions? How do you avoid uh, there being a dominant sort of um, hegemony established, you know, by early adopters or centralists, but yet how do you make the right decisions? So. So absolutely, coming back to your to your point, I think this is an evolving journey. I think no different to the hundreds of years to thousands of years of evolution of you know how decisions get made in, in civilization and societies. I think this is most certainly one of the very important chapters in the evolution of how we make these governance decisions. So, so just to come back to your point, I think the beauty of what Blue Frontiers is pioneering is by having uh, your own established um, residence or island or country, you know, uh, the things that, um, that, um, that we are aspiring to, you will also be able to establish your own ways of living, your own determination of government and having a token-based um, staking approach and having a, a, a form of uh, experiment. I think that that is absolutely critical for, for both the civilization as well as the economics. So, so this is something that has to be done.
Yeah. So I, I should have corrected you when we said that uh, Blue Frontiers has been at this for seven years. Technically, we have about 10 years of experience behind us. That's when the CSA Institute started. I joined the CSA Institute in 2011, the same time that Joe Quirk joined. Uh, and it's that, at that time that we started our, you know, or a few years later, we started the pivot to looking to bringing seasteads to protected waters of host nations rather than just trying to build them out in the open sea uh, because we thought it more practical, more uh, a more reasonable approach to the first seasteads to be in, in uh, waters where you could build for comfort and safety and still be uh, within existing supply chains and um, you know and under jurisdictions that can you're, you can work with as opposed to just being you know free at sea. Uh, I hear that you had a, a conversion moment. Uh, where you became a sea setter uh, in San Francisco when you saw Joe Quirk speak. Can you uh, yeah. recall that for us? Yeah, look, I, I think, you know, to put it really bluntly, I think, so obviously there is a, a tremendously powerful modularization, uh, which you guys are doing, which is it's proven technology, whether it's desalination of water, whether it's closed loop circles for, for fish to vegetation to food suppliers, whether it's, you know, um, waste, uh, whether it's, you know, there's all of this uh, technology which you guys are, are capturing. And it's simply using this to integrate it all into a, a viable, um, uh, livable environment. So, so obviously there's all of that good stuff. And then layer on top of that, obviously I'm a, I'm a deep environmentalist. Um, I deeply believe in the mission which you guys are purporting, which is can the sea, sea-based Blue Frontiers modules also clean the ocean. Um, can it do research? Can it do science? You know, can you visualize these in the same way as, say, the International Space Station? So all of that wrapped around, uh, obviously, um, I, I buy to and I agree. Uh, for me, what I thought was profound was, you know, just this idea, and um, it's touched upon more broadly, but um, I've looked extensively into the fishing rights, into the ocean rights of nations, um, and there are tr tremendous amounts of uh, Pacific islands which have vast areas of ocean which, which currently provide them with their economic income. Uh, and these, these, are, these, are, these uh, countries are, are sinking. They're being engul engulfed by the ocean. So I really saw this opportunity of helping um, bring some form of technology which would allow for them to establish their ongoing um, right to exist as well as right to that ocean uh, as opposed to just have it submerge and, and lose all of those ocean rights. And then lastly, coming back to, to your question, I think there are certain things that are possible at certain moments in time in certain places. And, you know, I think that San Francisco is one of those magical areas where so many amazing people can combine fueled by money, which borderline is philanthropic in, in some of its endeavors. Um, and that can then result in um, visions which can manifest in a way that I don't think many other places can. Uh, most other people are rooted and most other cities are rooted in the harsh realities of, of what's required to kind of live, to make a day, like make a living and, and, and survive. So, so just coming back, it was a fantastic conference. Joe did a phenomenal speech and showed how, you know, French Polynesia was really keen at progressing this um, pilot. And I could really visualize how, you know, there will be, without question, a proportion of the population that will live on these uh, these these styles of um, uh, housing, and and it will be something which will appeal to to many millennials, especially the whole generation that doesn't feel the need to own a house, own a car, own stuff. Uh, I can absolutely see that kindred spirits would would congregate. So so that was where I watched that speech, and I just I approached Joe after the speech, and I was like, you know, hey man. Um, this is my background. I, I, I teach at two universities in Sydney, University of New South Wales and University of Macquarie. And, and I can see how students, you know, would want to be, break their back and, and lend their hand to constructing this new, I won't say utopian because utopian can have negative connotations, but at least the next evolutionary step in, in how cities or how, how um, groups of people can live. Um, so, you know, our goal, you know, in our, in our in our pilot project, you know, what we're doing in the variant sales, we're trying to raise enough money to build the prototype and then be able to uh, start selling these seasteads and, and renting space and then having a circular economy using the variant 
where we don't have to then go and raise more money because we'll be able to grow the ecosystem itself and grow the economy of both sea setting and barium. And another important component for us is being able to manufacture these seasteads uh, cheaper and cheaper over time. So we're not just trying to build one uh, seastead or one pilot project. We're trying to, we want to set up a, you know, a factory type system so we can deploy these seasteads all over the world, all these places you're talking about. But we, we've identified or, or, you know, the studies say that there's about 10,000 communities that are going to be affected by rising seas and trillions of dollars of in infrastructure is going to be lost. So while our first project is a pilot project, it's just a first step way, you know, step into the seas, uh, over time, you know, we can imagine, you know, thousands of these communities all over the world, um, and people would, you know, live in them for a variety of reasons, whether it's because they want to try new governance models, or simply because they, they've lost their home and this is the best option for them. Um, as I understand it, Dorji, you've uh, you've been uh, the recipient of some uh, some some prestige over time uh, for your work in in trying to do some carbon removal. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, sure. And and you know, tying into what you just said, I think. Look, I mean, there's a great quote by Bobby Kennedy, and he said, "Never forget that the economy is a wholly owned subsidiary of the environment." Now, the sad thing is that when you look back on the last few hundred years of extraction. The, the, the cheap resources, not pricing in externalities. It's very clear that, you know, if there's, a, if there's an oil field, you know, if you drill it, you're gonna make a lot of money, but if you don't pay for the cost of all of the pollutants and the damage, then you're, you're actually, you're cheating future generations. So, you know, I was, I, was, I was pretty, I still am. I mean, my life's work, I think, will end up being, can we put a price on externalities? So. So a rainforest, which has all the biodiversity and all of the benefits and, and the amazing um, properties of generating rain, capturing CO2, um, housing, immense biodiversity, um, you know, they, they're valued at toilet paper. So right now there is zero value on it uh, unless you chop it down and turn it into some type of paper-based, you know, product or, or you graze cattle on it. So, you know, I spent 10 years uh, with carbon conservation really trying to, to, to raise awareness and raise money to protect rainforests in exchange for the sale of co carbon credits to carbon emitters. So, yeah, you know, I was very fortunate. I received an award uh, for the, you know, for the Earth Day, uh, you know, there was an Earth Day award. So um, there, was an, there was a new species of animal that, that was named after me, which was very flattering. And then I was one of, um, you know, Time Magazine's Heroes of the Environment. You know, but to kind of wrap it back to, to what you were saying and about, you know, this kind of next evolution, you know, sadly, I think that we're going to end up having the, what they call, you know, pulling up the, pulling up the ladder. So you're going to have dramatic um, collapses of ecosystems. You're going to have 9 billion people. You're going to have um, inward facing uh, domestic politics. So people like, you know, whether it's the Trump leadership you know, people are going to be more inward focused and, uh, you know, pulling up the drawbridge. And I think, look, that that lends itself to um, a, a group of people and a, and a number of people having to try and find a way that in this, you know, increasingly um, strong draw back from, from interna internationalization, you know, you're going to have a group of people and this is where the token becomes so powerful. If you do have, you know, a network of these um, like-minded, culturally like-minded, scientifically like-minded communities, and we're able to purchase the tokens, to, which is the currency, in, you know, of this network early. Yeah, I just think that the people who are going to start being attracted by this type of establishment is going to grow, and um, you know, it's going to be an incredibly divisive time. Unfortunately, I think that the baby boomers really were beneficiaries of both the ignorance is bliss, you know, of the extractive industries. They undoubtedly were able to take advantage of huge amounts of um, fish stock, forests, all of the natural resources, mining was easy. Uh, and I think the next generation is gonna be born into um, a definitely depleted ec economic um, natural resources. And, and I think that's where a sustainable way of living, a network of people, a network of communities bound together by a token um, is, a, is a very compelling proposition. 
Yeah. And, and speaking of next generations, uh, congratulations on your uh, new baby. So there's, there's two children in your life who uh, you're, you're working hard to, uh, to, to improve the world for. Yeah, look, I mean, I think that until you have a kid, it's, um, it's more theoretical. But after you have children, suddenly you realize, wow, in my lifetime, you know, look at what's happened. Now what's going to be the lifetime that they're going to embrace? So, you know, whether it's Albert Einstein who said that the world would only exist, human civilization would only exist for six years after the collapse of bees. And in real time, we're watching, you know, the collapse of colonies of bees, you know, whether it's looking at how, um, you know, in my daughter and my son's lifetime, you know, there's going to be continued dramatic extinction. Um, yeah, I think that I think that you got to you got to vote with your dollars, and I think that I think that the team behind Blue Frontiers has the best of intentions and has a chance, has a shot at a redefining step in the evolutionary process of where humanity um, and how humanity can govern itself and how it can value its environment. So, so that's why I'm I'm in. Yeah. Well, thanks for being in. You know, there are these two, you know, major pillars that we're trying to handle. One is uh, increasing opportunity for humans in their governance with the decentralized living on, on seasteads, and the other is trying to be resilient to rising seas. And and having you on the team since you've come on board a few months ago, more than a few months now, and and the counsel you've given us uh, in this process of trying to do our crowd sale uh, has been very valuable to all of us, and we uh, we appreciate having you here. So uh, thanks for bringing your uh, your rich experience, uh, both uh, in you know trying to protect the environment and in you know, the blockchain space uh, to to bear on Blue Frontiers. Yeah, thank you, Randy. I, I really commend the you and the entire team's work, and uh, we're going to get there. Thanks.